<laughs> Flint napping is an art and a skill as ancient as mankind. Napping is the act of shaping one rock with other rocks, sticks, and antlers to make a tool or utensil. We don't know, probably in Florida people have been doing it probably about eight, 9,000 years at the most. Uh, the earliest folks in Florida didn't do it, and all the way up until contact. Heat treating of the stone is an important first step to making it easier to work. A hole is dug, and the stones are carefully placed and covered with sand. Um, we're going to heat treat a few different things. We have a lot of chert from Florida. Um, we have a lot of coral from Florida, also a few different things, a little chert from Oklahoma, uh, some Texas chert. Uh, I have here some chert from Belize that's already been heat treated. And here's some coastal plains from Georgia, and I think we have a few pieces of that in there. And why is heat treating the stone important to the flint napping process? People think there's a few different things. Some people think it put like micro fractures in it. I believe more that what it does is returns it to a partial melt and basically allows the particles in it to, I guess, come back together in a smoother, more uniform manner. And that way when you flake it, it travels across the material cleaner and doesn't leave as many jagged edges and releases easier when you work it. So uh, while we've got the fire going, heat treating the rock, we're gonna also straighten some cane for the atlatl darts. All I'm doing is kind of looking down and seeing the areas where it needs to be straightened, picking one up, picking one out, heating it up over the fire, and then I'll just take it and bend it, bend it over my knee really slowly, not hard enough for it to break. This is the actual atlatl. And it has an integrated hook right here that holds the end of the dart. Thumb holes, finger holes. And this is Osage orange wood. There you go. There's that little tree in front of it. Once the fire is burned down to hot coals, they're spread over the sand and then covered with more sand and allowed to bake and heat the stone for about a day. All right, so we are about to uncover some of the rock. It's been about uh, 18 hours, I think, since we started the fire, maybe 19 hours, and it feels pretty cool, so we're going to see what happens. with the second layer you did. That's, That's still pretty hot. No. It's a little hot. It's warm. That's a piece of coral. This is 141 degrees. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Oh, this is your chert from Oh yeah. Your cousins. Oh. Yeah. You hear the difference in the sound? Yeah. More coral. Jeez. That went. Uh, this took a little heat. See on the top? It got yeah. reddish. It's a big piece of chert. So this is a piece of jasper from out west. And um, it was really grainy stuff. You can see how grainy it was before it was heat treated there. And I'll take a flake off of it. And that actually doesn't show it too well, but you see over here especially. It's taken on a luster and darkened up and become much smoother. It, it improves the quality of the flaking dramatically. So this here is crazing. This is what we don't want. This is probably some differential heating and it has all these little fractures in it now, but hopefully the whole stone isn't ruined. Coral. Oscillature. Ooh, that sounded good. Oh yeah, feel that. Oh yeah, that's much better now. This is Oklahoma chert, and before this one was kind of like a dull, dull gray color, and you can see from the heat treating it turned pink, and there's a little fossil right there. One of the differences is when you have chert that's been uh, heat treated well, there's a certain ting to it. And you see this stone was really coarse when we had heat treated it. And over here you can see that the color hasn't changed a lot, but there's a lot more luster to it, and it feels a lot harder and more consistent than it was before we cooked it. 
So this was a piece of stone that was probably really low quality and a bit of heat has improved it to a pretty high quality nappable stone. All right. So what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to pressure flake the edge of the uh, biface that I made from some of the stone that we cooked uh, yesterday. And this is an Ishi stick and it's just a long pressure flaker and there's hickory and this piece of antler inset in it. And what I'm doing is I'm taking the antler and I'm pressing into the edge of the biface and then pushing down and that takes little very controlled flakes. You can see them coming off here off the edge. And that helps to even out the edge and sharpen it, and when people use tools, this is how they resharpened tools also. And what's the other side? You got, uh, you got uh, the opposite of the deer at the antler. Oh, there's just a little piece of copper at the other end, um, and definitely at uh, different points of time further up north, they did have some copper pressure flakers. Um, it's much easier to use, lasts longer, and lower maintenance, but I, I prefer the antler actually, so I'll just keep using this side. So what are you using now? This is just a little piece of sandstone that I've had for a long time, and you can see it's beaten all the way around the edges. And we're using it as a braider. It's uh, become thinner in the middle. I actually have another one somewhere around here. Where's the other one? Oh. <laughs> and you can see after use, they start looking very similar. And what is that used for versus the deer antler? It does the same thing. It, it's um, basically a hammerstone. It's a percussor. And this is slightly harder, so it removes flakes um, with a bigger cone and a steeper edge as opposed to uh, an antler billet. Because it's soft here, you can see it's all bit up. And that holds on to the edge for a second and allows you to remove... Um, longer and wider and thinner flakes as opposed to this which are fatter and steeper okay that's a big antler what's that this is a moose antler you wouldn't have ever found this in florida though <laughs> there you go Neat. Neat. did that do what you thought it was going to do yeah so you can see the line that i drew right here mm -hmm. with a sharpie and it was it was pretty close pretty close to that practice makes perfect so this is just the flake that we removed off some of the coral, and you say how sharp it is. This is un this hasn't been retouched. Just this is how it came off the stone, and there's a piece of fairly thick leather. You Whoa. see how how sharp that gets. Wow, it's like a razor. Yeah. If you'd like to learn more about flint napping, then plan on going to the Silver River State Park Nap In and Stone Arts Festival, March 1st through 3rd in Ocala.